All right, hello everyone. Today we're gonna to tackle persuasion, which is kind of a long lecture, so hang in there with me, but um, all these concepts are things that we're really going to apply in our next persuasive unit and the bigger assignments to come. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about persuasion itself and how we use it and see it in society. So thinking about when have you been persuaded in the past week? Did you maybe ask your parents for money, um, persuade your boss for more hours at work, trying to get a better grade from a professor or a teacher, um, trying to get your friends or family to go to your favorite restaurant versus their favorite restaurant? Um, so basically these examples are hinting at the fact that we are always persuading in our everyday life, whether we think about it as persuasion or not, we are typically persuading at least probably once a day, if not more. So thinking about that, when have you persuaded someone in the past week? When have you been persuaded in the past week? So have you bought anything? I always think about going to the store, like if you're out of toothpaste, and there is a whole aisle of toothpaste. How do you choose which one you're going to buy? That can probably be what you've always had, so what's always been in your house, what, what your parents have always bought you. Um, it might be based on flavor that you narrow it down. It might be based on a brand that you prefer. It might even be based on really cool packaging, something that just catches your eye on the shelf. So all of that is playing into persuasion. Have you watched TV, I'm sure, in the past week or so? Um, do you see advertisements, commercials? Are they use, What are they using on um, your favorite shows? What kinds of clothing brands are people wearing? What kind of soda are they drinking in the television show? Did they go to Starbucks? All of that is persuasion, right? We're just inadvertently seeing um, these ads all around us all the time. Have you taken a drive? Any billboards that you saw? Any restaurants that you passed? All of that stuff. So we are constantly living in a world where we are inundated with these advertisements, all of which, again, are persuasion, right? So persuasive speaking may be the most used and abused of all forms of oral communication. And what I mean by that goes back to this, right? We are constantly persuading one another and we are constantly being persuaded ourselves. So here's a couple examples from um, modern society today. We have this Black Friday that we all flock to or hear about or both, right? So Black Friday is just these amazing sales that we all have to have or want to have and we'll do absolutely anything for. Uh, we line up like ha like cattle, literally, to be uh, led through stores and we fight over um, deals on the shelf, right, just trying to save a couple bucks. So getting us to do that is persuasion, those big drops in prices and the big hoopla associated with the day, right? Then we have celebrity endorsement. That's a form of persuasion, right? So if you use proactive here in this ad, um, the, the correspondence or the, not the correspondence, the connection there is uh, that you will look like Jessica Simpson, have Jessica Simpson skin if you are using proactive, right? And we know that's probably not the case, but it might persuade us to try and hope that we'll get a little bit closer to Jessica Simpson, right? Here, this is a real crosswalk in a city, um, and the McDonald's sits on the corner over here. So as you're walking across the crosswalk, you're thinking about McDonald's fries. So it's subconsciously persuading you to go to that McDonald's on the corner, making you want a fry. Then we have Frosty's, or uh, what's it called? Frosted Flakes, and Tony the Tiger, and he says, they're great. Well, Frosted Flakes are yummy, but they have very, very, very little nutritional value. It's just a sugary cereal, right? But as kids, we saw these, these commercials on TV and these advertisements on the cereal box, and we wanted Tony the Tiger. They're great just because of that slogan and ad, and then because also we know that they're good, right? Okay, so there are some popular culture examples of advertising and persuasion. 
So persuasive speaking is the most complex and most challenging type of speaking. It requires much more demand for audience analysis and adaptation with your topics. And topics will deal with audience's beliefs and your actions, which beliefs and actions which can increase their resistance to your topic, right? So you are going to be pushing against resistance in the hopes of pulling people towards your viewpoint and assimilating um, with information, assimilating your audience with new information or a different take on information. So that's what we're going for here in persuasion. Again, noting that considering your audience becomes even more prevalent in the persuasive setting. So the definition of persuasion, the process of creating, reinforcing, or changing people's attitudes, beliefs, values, and subsequently behavior, okay? So let's look at these individually. Attitudes are learned predispositions to respond favorably or unfavorably, our likes and our dislikes. Beliefs are what we understand to be true or false based on experiences and or faith. And our values are enduring concepts of right or wrong. And guys, what we are actually shooting for here um, in our six to nine minute speeches is the changing of attitudes, really. So I like to think about this as a reverse bullseye. So normally you are trying to hit, if you have your bullseye, you're trying to hit the very center, right? That is your goal. Well, we're going to think about this a little bit backwards. We're going to have our values in the middle. Our values are going to be that core of our target. And then we have beliefs that are going to get a little bit wider, and our attitudes are going to be even wider yet. And we're shooting for these attitudes on the very outside of our target because they are the most easily hit. So knowing that our values, those enduring concepts of, our, of what's right or wrong, are probably not going to be moved within this six to nine minute speech, the speech for, right? So um, beliefs we might be able to move into, we might be able to hit some beliefs, but attitudes are really what we're shooting for. We might be able to move or change a behavior based on a like or dislike. That might be a more feasible goal for our six to nine minute speech. So shooting for attitudes that outside of our target, okay? So examples of attitudes. Attitudes are easier to alter, so it might be something like, how do you feel about um, a certain brand of yogurt compared to a different brand of yogurt? Or how do you feel about this restaurant versus this restaurant, this brand versus this brand? Um, maybe you really, really, really like a certain restaurant and you go there all the time whenever you have the chance. And then one time maybe you get food poisoning from that restaurant and that really changes your attitude and the next couple times you get to choose, you don't choose the restaurant that gave you food poisoning, obviously, right? So that is a shift in attitude. It's pretty easy to change someone's attitude. Maybe you had bad customer service, uh, that kind of thing, and that changes your attitude about a place. Beliefs here are um, things like a long time ago, people believed that the earth was flat. And then with, with all of this research and time and scientists and new technology, we found out that the earth is actually a sphere, right? But it took a lot for us to change that initial belief that the earth was flat. So do we see the difference between attitudes and beliefs? Values here are something like, um, killing is wrong, child abuse is wrong, um, killing someone is bad, going, going back to all those things that we inherently hold to be true. And even if you told me uh, for a day straight that child abuse was okay or that killing someone was okay, don't think about that too much. Killing someone is okay in our very core base belief, I, our very core value. I won't change my mind on that. That's something that is that is very strong in my in myself, and I'm not going to change that, especially in a six to nine minute speech. So again, shooting for those attitudes out here on our bullseye.
And then guys, noting that persuasive speaking is not a trick or not being sneaky and it requires you to be very upfront and honest with your audience. So we are going to tell our audience exactly what we want from them in the very beginning, in our intro of our speech. Being very upfront, we're not hiding any, in, any information, okay? So thinking about how persuasion works, we're going to go back to Aristotle's approach in that classic rhetoric. So we have ethos, which is credibility. That's the main word we're going to tie to ethos, which is ethical speaking, good character, and common sense. So that ties to indirect um, logic there. Okay, and then we're going to look at logos, which is rational, logical arguments. So logos, logical, and that's a direct route of persuasion. And then we have pathos, which is the use of emotional appeals, so tugging on people's heartstrings. And that, too, is an indirect mode of persuasion. So we're thinking about this here on our triangle, and I like to think about this as our toolbox. And we'll talk about some theories that play into our toolbox. But we have three main tools. We have ethos, logos, and pathos. We always have to have that ethos at the top. And then we are going to probably rely on a mix of both logos and pathos, but sometimes maybe relying more heavily on one or the other, depending on the situation. And we'll get into some examples of that. So the first theory we're going to talk about here is elaboration likelihood model, shortened to ELM. An elaboration likelihood model is used uh, to elaborate. It means to think critically about the persuasive issue at hand. And there's two ways you can be persuaded here. So the direct persuasive route, tying back to here. Direct persuasive route, which one is that? We know that's logos, that's those facts, okay? So direct persuasion, elaboration, and critical thought. And then we have indirect persuasion route, which is you don't elaborate as much, you're more influenced by factors such as credibility and emotion, so that ethos and that pathos. Knowing that we're always going to have a mix of both, we might just rely more heavily on one or the other. The key here, guys, is opinions formed using the direct route last longer and are less apt to fade over time. So I always use the example here when we're talking about ELM. The central route, which you can write in your notes, the central route is the direct route. It's high involvement and more knowledge. So this is something like buying a house, right? You are very, very involved. It's a very big life choice, a lot of money on the line, right? And you want as much knowledge as you can possibly aggregate about that house and that buying situation. The peripheral route, you're most likely involved with a low involvement and less knowledge here. So maybe you're trying that new brand of toothpaste because you really like the new packaging or a cool new flavor. Um, and it's really low involvement. If you don't like it, it was probably anywhere from 3 to $5. And you probably didn't do a whole lot of research when you were picking out a toothpaste, right? I also always make the joke, going back to the house, who of the guy or the girl stereotypically uh, would be more concerned with the central or peripheral route. My dad is a real estate broker in Cody, Wyoming, um, and he always talks about how the guys are like, well, it's an older house and we'll have to worry about electricity and uh, plumbing and all those things, replacing things all the time because it's an older place. And then the ladies are like, oh, but the character, the character in this house, I could do this, this, and this. When I decorate it, I could fix this, this, and this up. So they are over here with this low involvement. They're thinking with their emotions right and they are not thinking as much with that central route and the consequences right so just a fun interesting way of thinking about ELM um, in the real world and we process information through these two routes so it's motivation so your involvement again here and your ability your knowledge so how do those two things play in with your topic <laughs> And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, milk cows, work all day in the fields, milk cows again, eat supper, then go to town and stay past midnight at a meeting of the school board. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to sit up all night with a newborn colt 
and watch it die and dry his eyes and say, maybe next year. I need somebody who can shape an axe handle from a persimmon sprout, shoe a horse with a hunk of car tire, who can make harness out of hay, wire feed sacks and shoe scraps, who planting time and harvest season will finish his 40 hour week by Tuesday noon and then pain in from tractor back, put in another 72 hours. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink combed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadow lark. So God made a farmer. It had to be somebody who'd plow deep and straight and not cut corners. Somebody to seed, weed, feed, breed and rake and disc and plow and plant and tie the fleece and strain the milk. Somebody who'd bale a family together with the soft, strong bonds of sharing who would laugh and then sigh and then reply with smiling eyes when his son says that he wants to spend his life doing what dad does. So God made a farmer. Okay, so that's a Dodge Ram truck commercial. Um, they use that story of God made a farmer to um, get to their brand. So they're playing and tugging on your heartstrings, telling that story, um, using that pathos, those emotions um, to enhance their brand and support their brand. Uh, so that is that indirect route with elaboration likelihood model. And now we'll look at an example um, from Ford Trucks about the direct model. Watch this tough truck demonstration. We're dropping the 78 Ford pickup in a free fall. To prove a point, Ford pickups are built tough. Let's see that again. Some terrific pounding, huh? It's nice to know a Ford took a free fall like this without damage. And good to know you've got strong twin I-beam suspension up front when you hit bumps like these. Ford, built down to earth tough. 93 out of 100 of all Ford trucks registered over the last 12 years are still on. So there we see the difference between that indirect, that storytelling, tucking on our heartstrings, with the direct and that more knowledge, that higher involvement, we want to know the facts, um, we want to know all the stats, we want to see the examples of how that truck itself is going to work, not the lifestyle that it fits into, but to the actual toughness um, and utility of that truck. So those are just two examples from your life about the elaboration likelihood model and the difference between indirect and direct. Again, knowing that you're always going to have that ethos, that credibility, um, and then you may rely more heavily on one or the other with indirect or direct. Uh, but typically you're going to have a nice little mix there. That's what good speakers can do is weave in um, those stories with the facts. Then we have social judgment theory. So tool one, elaboration likelihood model. Tool two, social judgment theory. So for every controversial issue, human opinions fall on a range or, or continuum. And your anchor represents your ideal position or opinion. So here I have an example. Here's our continuum and here is our anchor, okay? So going back here, each one of us has a latitude of acceptance, positions that are close enough to our anchor that we agree with them. So we have this wiggle room. We have our anchor and then we're willing to sway a little bit one way or the other. And then each of us has a latitude of rejection, positions far enough away from our anchor that we disagree with them. So our anchor is never going to move that far. The key here, guys, is any movement is persuasion. So even if you are just moving from here to even here, to where you're more moderately in favor than slightly in favor, you have persuaded. So we are not going for these big jumps. You're not going to move from strongly in favor to strongly opposed. Those are not realistic jumps. You might move maybe from neutral to slightly in favor or slightly in favor to moderately but we're never gonna make these big leaps in persuasion. So noting that anytime you are persuading one way or the other, you are successful, okay? 
So four ways to motivate your audience here. We have cognitive dissonance, we have appealing to listeners' needs, and then positive and negative emotion, or negative motivation. And we'll go through each of those here. So cognitive dissonance first. You've probably heard of this term. It occurs when our thoughts, our behavior, and our perceptions of ourselves don't match up. So when our cognitive elements are in discord, we experience mental discomfort, which prompts us to do something. So we had up here, let me find it again, this change in behavior that we are going for. So our definition of persuasions is the process of creating, reinforcing, or changing people's attitudes, beliefs, and values, or behavior. So typically when you are changing an attitude, belief, or value, you are subsequently changing their behavior as well. Okay? So that's what we are trying to do here with cognitive dissonance prompting people to do something. So if we can introduce our audience to information that conflicts with their previously organized thought patterns, we can persuade them to change their thoughts and behavior. Okay, so looking here, how do people cope with dissonance? They either discredit the information, so they're saying, eh, that's not true, I'm going to discredit you. So what can you do there? Make sure you as the speaker are sharing really credible information and you are supporting that probably in multiple ways with several examples and you're really working, working on that positioning of the research as well. Okay? Reinforcing, uh, refocus on parts of the message not creating dissonance. So they're essentially just going to forget about the part that they don't like or don't agree with, uh, makes them feel uncomfy, and they're going to focus on the stuff that they're okay with. Okay. Seek new information to prove speakers' ideas wrong. So that you're either throwing it away and focusing on something else. So what can you do to make sure that they are, you're bringing back the uncomfy information and making them noodle and think about it, okay? Or they're going to seek new information to prove you wrong. So I call this poking holes in your argument. And how can you address those holes before the audience is poking that hole? Because then they're poking that hole and all they're thinking about is what they can say to discredit you. Right? So how can you take away any of that thought process? How can you be thorough enough that they cannot question your argument? Or they just stop listening and tune out. So you have to be careful about your approach and you're really considering the audience and their thoughts and feelings moving into the topic and how you might be able to organize and position your message to get them to listen, right? You're going to change attitudes. That is what we're going for. Changing attitudes, beliefs, values, or actions to reduce that dissonance. So we're hoping here that all these things are coming together and we are doing our best job with persuasion and coming out here with a change in behavior. Okay. Here's examples of cognitive dissonance. These are, oops, we can get rid of that. I'll make this a little bit bigger for you. So these are tobacco ads in, or were, are or were tobacco ads in Europe. So compared to tobacco ads in the United States where there's just that Surgeon General's warning that says it's probably pretty bad for you and you should look into it, um, these are actually showing you. So they are creating that cognitive dissonance here saying smoking causes mouth and throat cancer, here it is. Smoking clogs your arteries, there it is. Don't let children breathe your smoke, example here. So that's hitting home. That with a visual is creating that cognitive dissonance in your mind and making you think about the consequences of smoking, right? Here's another, guys. Pretty gross stuff going on, okay? So cognitive dissonance. Do we want to see these things or not? We probably don't, but seeing them makes us think twice. That's cognitive dissonance, making someone think twice and hopefully then changing that behavior, okay? All right, guys, our third tool that we're going to talk about today is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And this is using listeners' needs involves centering arguments around the requirements and desires of your audience members. So this couples with that audience analysis. And the key here, I'm going to say this and emphasize it, the key here is that the bottom levels must be met before you can move up the pyramid. 
and if something is no longer met, you can move back down on the pyramid. So first of all, we must have the basic necessities, food, water, and air. We must have food, water, and air before we can worry about clothing and shelter. We must have safety and physiological needs met before we can even consider worrying about social esteem and self-actualization. So social is that belonging with others, esteem is that respect from others and ourselves, and then self-actualization, which some of us never reach and very few of us can maintain, is personal identity, independence, happiness, and potential. So you might jump up to self-actualization, and then life happens and you get knocked back down, and then eventually you work back up. But this is our goal, that self-actualization, knowing that all of these needs have to be met before we can get there. So for example here, guys, I would give a speech on plastic surgery to who? The homeless, people who have steady jobs but are unhappy with their appearance, unemployed women who have low self-esteem, or people who consider themselves to be lone wolves. So logically here, the homeless, where are they sitting? They maybe have their physiological needs met and they're working on the safety. So we cannot get up to here to this esteem level with plastic surgery that social esteem, self-actualization, wherever you think that may fit in based on situation, okay, we are not going to choose the homeless there, right? People who have steady jobs but are unhappy with their appearance, so where do they fit here? They have these things, okay? They can meet these needs. They're working on the upper needs, yeah? Unemployed women who have low self-esteem. Again, here, you don't have the means to fix this yet. Okay. People who consider themselves to be lone wolves, so they're social, they're okay with. Their esteem, they're probably okay with, right? They are not con really concerned here with how plastic surgery will influence their needs. Okay, So our choice here is going to be people who have steady jobs, who have met those lower levels, and are working to meet the upper with their appearance. So plastic surgery would most correspond with two. Yeah? Okay, so thinking about speech topics here, what could we tackle? And uh, maybe the need for clean water around the world, um, maybe the need to adopt, maybe the need to stop bullying uh, for social, maybe esteem, it's going to be um, beauty or body image, um, and then self-actualization, that person, personal identity, happiness, and potential, I'll leave that up to you. That's really hard to tackle and usually a very individualized basis. Um, organ donation is another one here, okay? Uh, fitting in probably to physiological and safety, yeah? So tackling those big things and how can you tie in these principles from these theories into your arguments? So we're weaving in that 30% new information and that 70% positioning. That's where you can use these theories, okay? Then we have positive motivation. So positive motivation is based on rewards. So basically the premise that good things will happen if you accept my proposition. It emphasizes that positive values will be maintained or restored, emphasizes benefits and features, and its appeal to emotion, so that pathos, not just lo logos, that, not just logic, that logos. Okay, so here is an example. If each of you turned off your printers before you left the house, you would save enough electricity to buy two pizzas a month all year long. So if you turn off your printer every day, you get two pizzas by the end of the month. That's positive motivation. If we all agreed that capital punishment is wrong, we could vote to end it and then save the lives of innocent men and women. That's a more serious example of positive motivation. Now here is a example from a Dove Beauty commercial of positive motivation. I'm a forensic artist. Worked for the San Jose Police Department from 1995 to 2011. I showed up to a place I'd never been and there was a guy with a drafting board. We couldn't see them, they couldn't see us. Tell me about your hair. I didn't know what he was doing, but then I could tell after several questions that he was drawing me. Tell me about your chin. It kind of protrudes a little bit, hmm. especially when I smile. Your jaw? My mom told me I had a big jaw. 
What would be your most prominent feature? Kind of have a fat, rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckles I've gotten. I would say I have a pretty big forehead. Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see them. All I had been told before the sketch was to get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about a person you met earlier, and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin, so you could see her cheekbones. And her chin, it was a nice, thin chin. She had nice eyes. They lit up when she spoke. Cute nose. She had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. So here we are. This is the sketch that you helped me create. And that's a sketch that somebody described of you. So yeah, that's... She looks closed off and fatter, sadder too. Mm -hmm. The second one looks more open, friendly, and happy. Mm -hmm. I should be more grateful of my natural beauty. It impacts the choices and the friends that we make, the jobs we apply for, how we treat our children. It impacts everything. It couldn't be more critical to your happiness. Do you think you're more beautiful than you say? Yeah. Yeah. We spend a lot of time as women analyzing and trying to fix the things that aren't quite right. And we should spend more time appreciating the things that we do like. Okay, so there we see positive motivation at work. We're giving us all these examples from different people in real life and showing that if you change how you view yourself, um, all these other positive attributes will change about your life. Um, so cool uh, real life example from a Dove, Dove soap commercial. So, okay, moving into negative motivation. Negative motivation is based on punishment. So bad things will happen if you don't accept my proposition. And this is also called a fear appeal. And if we ignore all the evidence of alien life, we could miss out on the opportunity to encounter other life forms. So that's an example of negative motivation. If you don't agree that torturing prisoners of war is wrong, we are no better than the enemies we are fighting overseas. So funny example, serious example, and then here's another example from the Wyoming Meth Project of negative motivation. I'm really tight with my friends. We do everything together. And whatever happens, they look out for me. Okay, you guys, so there is a very clear, obvious example of negative motivation, right? If you do drugs, bad things will happen. So keeping that in mind, how might you be able to use that negative, uh, negative motivation, that fear appeal to help make your point and position the severity of something to your audience? The key here with fear appeals is that you always have to have a solution or a means to make that problem better in order, in order for the fear appeal to be successful. So for instance, instance, this wasn't in my class, but in um, my professor's class, he told us this story when I was in college, and he said that one of his students had presented um, a speech on how Yellowstone was going to erupt at some point, um, and it was long overdue, and um, the consequences of Yellowstone erupting are catastrophic for not only our region, but also the world as a whole. So she was relying heavily on negative 
uh, motivation and that fear appeal, but there is no solution. There's nothing that man can do to stop Yellowstone from erupting, right? And I guess there was a girl in class that um, was from back east and had never really studied Yellowstone as significantly as typically um, those in our area do, and she was like distraught about the whole idea. And um, so we, we just have to be sure that we have that solution to the fear appeal. That's the key there. There's something that the audience can do, some actions and behavior um, to solve the problem, okay? So negative motivation here. Negative motivation works best when speakers appear competent and trustworthy. So we have to believe in the problem. We have to believe you that there's a fix. The possible negative consequences seem real to the audience, so it's something that they can picture themselves in their lives. Loved ones are targeted instead of oneself. So I've actually heard about a study, um, I think it was from YDOT, and they were trying to figure out how to get men to wear um, their seatbelts more. Um, and they did a bunch of advertising campaigns trying to get men themselves to put on their seatbelts and stating the importance of putting on their seatbelts for their lives. And that wasn't working too well. So then they tried a campaign um, saying that if you don't put on your seatbelt, you're endangering the rest of the people in your car, which could be killing your children, family members, friends, um, if you're bouncing around the car during a wreck because you weren't wearing your seatbelt. And that hit home with people. So targeting loved ones instead of targeting oneself, uh, that's another component of a negative motivation that you can think about in structuring your message. And then I have another example here from the Wyoming Meth Project that says, my mom knows I'd never hurt her. Then she got in the way. So going back to those visual aids, how can you use visual aids to help people position not only what you're saying, but seeing it visually um, and putting it into their lives and their seats in that moment, okay? So now let's talk about developing our persuasive speech. So first of all, we always have to consider the audience. And then obviously we're going back to selecting and narrowing our persuasive topic, determining your persuasive purpose, and then developing that central idea, that overall goal, and those subsequent main points based on the organizational pattern that is available to us and that we choose out of the options. So do not expect drastic changes. We're going back to um, that anchor, right? We're never going to move our anchor a ton. That social judgment theory, even just a baby step is persuasion, right? Okay, so considering our audience, will your audience react favorably to emotional appeals? Could they reject your logic? Might they be threatened by your fear appeals? Is that working in your favor? Are there any cultural differences between you and them that could affect your persuasive message? So all those are what you're thinking about when you're considering your audience. And as always, going back to I can help you submit surveys. Um, you can ask people online via email or join some office hours. We're going to have that um, workshop moving into speech number four. And um, you can ask these questions and structure your message based on your responses or surveys that you get from your audience. And you don't have to do the class as a whole. You can make it simpler and do just your group as well. Okay, so select and narrow your topic. Do you sincerely feel strongly about your topic? You have to do that in order to really establish that credibility um, and get people to buy into your message. Does it appeal to listeners' passions? Is it important? Controversial topics are fine, but you have to have that appropriate support. Speakers should pay attention to the media to keep current on important issues. So I'll give you an example here briefly. Um, I was in a PR class, a public relations class in college, and our final project was to save BlackBerry, the failing company. And our big proposition in this huge, huge paper and analysis, market analysis, was that they needed a new CEO. They needed new leadership with a different vision. So we submitted this paper. We'd been up for like 24 hours putting on the final touches. Not kidding, it was a huge project. Um, and then our teacher wrote at the top of our paper when we got it back, it was due on a Friday and like that Tuesday, BlackBerry had gotten a new CEO. So our entire proposition um, to solve the problem was no longer relevant. And I think we got a D on the paper. So thinking about that, guys, is the... Is it relevant in society now? Is it important in society now? And are you current on the issues? So you need to be researching up until you present.
So survey, can you see how your audience feels about the topic? Again here, going into even selecting your topic and narrowing which piece of the puzzle you might want to tackle. And this again can be written in anonymous or you can ask the class to raise their hands in any online meetings that we have that you're in or you can just send out a survey to um, your, your group members as well and I'm happy to help with that. Okay, so you want to set a reasonable goal. Again, we're not expecting those drastic changes. And here you're always going to look back at that social judgment theory there. Okay, so back to basics. At the top of our outlines, our general purpose is now going to be to persuade. And in persuasive speaking, we use propositions rather than central ideas. So your proposition is going to replace your central idea at the top of your page and within your intro. So the statement you want your audience to agree with, this is your stance. So your central idea was your goal. Now your proposition is going to be your stance. And remembering that we always include that central idea, now that proposition in our intro paragraph as well. So there's three types of propositions we can choose from. And our first assignment, that fact value persuasive outline, is going to focus on either a proposition of fact or a proposition of value. A proposition of fact focuses on whether something is true or false or whether something did or did not happen. So it's like a yes or no proposition. Bigfoot exists, global warming is occurring on our planet, low carb diets do not help with weight management. So it is how, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna emphasize this guys, it is how it is written, not necessarily your opinion reading the proposition. So how the proposition is written determines uh, whether it is fact or value, okay? So for example, I give a quiz when I teach this in person that says, um, and this is a very just generic statement because I want to emphasize it's how it's written. It says Republicans are stupid. That is not my viewpoint, okay? But that is just an example. Republicans are stupid. That is structured as a proposition of fact, but you think about it as an opinion which lends you to think it's a value. It is a fact. It is written as a fact. Republicans are stupid. Fact. Okay, see the difference there? Here's examples. Proposition of fact must deal with topics in which there are doubts about the facts in the matter. In other words, in order for your proposition of fact to work for this class, it must be a stance that someone can argue against. People can argue against, obviously, and should argue probably against, that Republicans are stupid, right? So propositions of fact, we're avoiding that duh factor. The duh factor is what I call it when persuasive speeches are given on topics that there is no argument about or that we are already convinced of. Duh factor speeches happen when students pick four topics for persuasive speeches. So we're avoiding these kinds of topics. Seatbelts save lives. No duh. Drinking and driving is dangerous. No duh. Exercise is beneficial. We got it. Cocaine is a harmful narcotic. Yes, we know. Okay, so we are avoiding these dev factor things. Another one is Pepsi is better than Coke. Michael Jordan is the best basketball player ever. We, we can argue against those things, but they are not really prevalent, very super important issues in society at large today. Okay, that leads us into propositions of value. What I just said, better or more right. So I said Michael Jordan is the best basketball player. So the best cues me into that is a, it is a proposition of value. Pepsi is better than Coke. That's a proposition of value. A poor proposition to tackle for a speech, but a proposition of value nonetheless, okay? So here's an example. The death penalty is immoral. So anything like unethical, ethical, immoral, moral, um, those are propositions of value, okay? So socialism is better, is a better form of government than democracy. A better is what, uh, cues you into it's a proposition of value. And torturing prisoners of war is wrong, right, wrong. Those are propositions of value. Typically, guys, with propositions of fact, anytime there is the word is in there, um, we can infer that it is a proposition of fact. So global warming is occurring on our planet. Proposition of fact, I see that word is. Things that will catch you there with that example is when you have is immoral. So if that is is followed by a value word here, the value word trumps the is. OK, 
Okay, so be careful. If there's an is, it's not an automatic fact. You have to check and make sure that there's not also a value word somewhere in that proposition, making it a proposition of value. Okay. All right. So here are bad ones again. Joe Blow is the best athlete. We talked about that. Mexico is the best place to go for spring break. Pepsi is better than Coke. We're going to avoid those kinds of things. I want strong societal issues that are impacting our lives today. So we're tackling things a little bit more important there. Okay, and lastly, we have this proposition of policy. So this advocates for a specific change in law, procedure, or behavior. And this is a direct cue. If there is the word should or needs to in a proposition, it is a proposition of policy. So each student at our school should receive a new personal computer. That is a proposition of policy. Okay. Okay, all, so this is really important. We're going to use propositions of policy for speech number four. So again, you're choosing between fact or value for your first persuasive assignment. And then all the way at the end, speech number four, a proposition of policy. So these deal with whether a specific course of action should or should not be taken. So it's a call to action. They may deal with questions of fact or value, which we're already going to establish on our topic. But they always go beyond the fact or value to decide what should be done about it. So we're we're taking what we learned in our fact value and then advocating for a solution to that problem. So we are saying what actions should happen here. So these this is a real advertising campaign that says plastic bags kill um, and you're actually holding the bag walking around. It's a bio, biodegradable bag. Um, so you need these. This is the action that should be taken. This is what you're advocating um, for pollution in the ocean, those kinds of things. Okay. Over here, this is an ad for a Palm Pilot. So going back a little bit, oops, going back a little bit in time there, but you have chaos. You have things written all over. You have post-it notes everywhere, maybe. Um, and this ad is saying, so to solve your chaos, to solve this problem, you need this device, this Palm Pilot. Okay, so that is their solution to a chaotic life. There are two types of um, this, this agreement. So this is to gain passive agreement. Your goal is to convince the audience that a certain policy is desirable without encouraging them to take any action in support of the policy. So here you are just gaining agreement towards your solution, saying that a third party should take action. So you're going to use this if it's not something that you yourself as a public speaking student can fix. Okay, so this might be something that a higher level needs to fix. It might be an educational system. It might be the government. It might be management. It's not something that you can fix. And I'll get to where you might be able to bridge the gap between passive agreement and immediate action here in a second. But these are issues that you acknowledge. You know what needs to happen, but someone else must make that leap and actually um, partake in the solution, okay? So here are our passive agreement examples. Um, and here is censorship, right? Here's an example here. Um, we don't really, and he's probably just like tapping her arm, right? But with this censorship example, we don't know. So that is something that you yourself as a public speaking student cannot fix. That is um, legalized uh, what is censored and what is not, right, in the court system. So it's, it's a higher party, it's a higher entity that has to, has to make a change there. So at the end of my speech, my audience will agree that fast food restaurants should be held liable for overweight, overweight Americans. So we're changing our specific purpose here too. It's going to say, will agree. At the end of my speech, my audience will agree that the U.S. should have stricter gun laws. So we'll agree we're changing for persuasion and using should for that proposition of policy. And here's an example that says one child is holding something that's been banned in America to protect them. Guess which one? And this is Little Red Riding Hood. Okay, so this is um, an ad there from Moms Demand Action, a nonprofit group. Okay. Just an example, no stance coming from me there. <laughs> Again, purely an example. Okay, the other type here, so we have passive agreement and immediate action. So to gain immediate action, your goal is to convince the audience to take action in support of a specific policy right now. So you want us to do something. And this here says liking isn't helping. And they have the thumbs up for like. So then you're going to correspond with that and say what you can actually do that's going to make a difference in that child's life today. Right? 
immediate action examples here. At the end of my speech, the audience will donate so we can actually use that verb to an organization supporting torture victims. So that's an active, measurable verb, donate. At the end of my speech, my audience will volunteer at the local organization against violence. And here this says on the back of the seat, victims are people just like you and me. And this says, um, please don't lose control over your drinking. Um, so these are just, it's a preventative beer mug, great. Right? These are real life examples, great visual aids to correspond with the overall goal of the speech and the actions you want your audience to take. Um, so first of all, analyzing these propositions of policy, is there a need for change in the current policy? If it isn't broke, don't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So if there's something that doesn't need to be changed, we're not necessarily tackling it. The burden of proof, so that need to prove that there is a problem, a need for change, it rests with you. You have to tell us and analyze and explain that problem and then give us that practical solution to the problem. And this ad over here says it's not happen happening here, but it is happening now in reference to child slavery. This is just a clear like plexiglass um, with a, a image of a child soldier there. Okay, so this one, do you have a plan to solve the current problem? You have to have a plan and it has to be practical. So complaining is easy, creating a solution is the real challenge here. And this says every 60 seconds a species dies out, and I believe that's a German nonprofit from this ad here. Is the plan practical? Does it solve the problem or will it create even more problems? So specifically thinking about budgets, a lot of times people will say they have a huge budget. They should be able to allocate some of those funds towards solving this problem. Well, are you going to create other problems by taking funding away elsewhere? So you're analyzing all of that. Again, taking away any holes that the audience could poke in your argument. So this is where most speakers fail without proposi with propositions of policy. We won't like a solution solution that doesn't sound feasible. And this here is an ad by the UN Women. Um, a while ago, I think when a bunch of stuff was going on in the war, um, this was an actual Google search that said women need to, and these were things that popped up on that, on that worldwide Google search. Okay guys, so we're constantly coming back to that human connection and how can we make this problem real and the solution feasible? How can I present my plan in a way that the audience is really going to buy into, hopefully accept, if not move a little bit more favorably towards your viewpoint? All right. And we'll go back to talking about credibility here and how that fits into our persuasive uh, knowledge and our persuasive stance as a speaker, okay? So to effectively persuade an audience, you must present yourself as competent, that's your knowledge and skill, trustworthy, that comes in delivery, your believability and your honesty, and dynamic, your energy level and delivery. And there's three types of credibility. There's initial credibility before you speak, so that's something like your dress and maybe making eye contact with the audience before you speak. Um, it's faking it till you make it, right? That initial credibility, looking professional and prepared before you speak. Derived credibility, that's as you speak, so we build that into our intro. And then terminal credibility after you speak. So especially in person, I see people that are almost leaving in front of the classroom before they're even done speaking. So terminal credibility might be that you are able to answer in Q&A. It might be that you just stand there for a second and let the audience acknowledge you before sitting down. So terminal credibility after you speak. Without credibility, you are not persuading. Persuasion is not credibility. Persuasion is not possible without credibility. Okay, so ways to boost our credibility. You wanna establish common ground with the audience, so we're always going for that human connection. You want well-documented evidence, so we're always citing as much as we can about a source, the year, the author, um, possibly even the, the source of the publication. For instance, like the New York Times, when we hear that, we know it's a very credible source. Uh, well-organized ideas and well-managed delivery. So we're following certain organizational patterns to achieve, and then we have practiced that delivery and we're presenting in a dynamic way. Okay, guys, moving into reasoning. So this is that logos, right? So persuasive speakers must give careful attention to the use of logic, logos, to make conclusions. Speakers use reason, reasoning, evidence, and proof to state their case. 
So speakers may utilize three types of reasoning, inductive, deductive, and causal. So I'll talk about inductive first. Inductive reasoning uses observations and experiences to persuade, so it moves from a specific instance to a generalization about the thing or idea, decides what is probably true or likely true. So inductive reasoning, I say inductive up, so the point is up, and you're moving from several observations down to a general conclusion. So for instance, I went to school in Laramie, Wyoming. During January in Laramie, it's usually cold. Therefore, it will be cold in Laramie this January. So I have several years to um, show this evidence that it was cold in January. So therefore, I'm going to conclude that it's going to be cold in January this coming January. Okay. Every time I drop my pencil, it falls to the floor. Floor. You can see that now. Okay. Every time I drop my pencil, it's going to fall to the floor. I pick it up again, I drop it again, it's going to fall to the floor. So the third time I pick it up and let go, I'm going to assume that it's going to drop to the floor. Yes? Therefore, when I drop my pencil this time, it will fall to the floor. That is inductive reasoning. Another example here, students are sneezing in the dorms and classrooms, instance one. Professors are canceling class, instance two. Campus clinic has long waiting lines, instance three. There must be flu on campus is my general consensus there. Inductive reasoning, you can use reasoning by analogy. So are there similarities between both that are greater than the difference? Is the conclusion actually true? If you conclude what is true for one can be true for the other, then the analogy is strong. Can you fit in those analogies within that 70% to, po to position your research and with your persuasive arguments? You can have causal, so to include, conclude that one or more events caused another. So here's cause to effect. Interest rates have increased this week. The Dow Jones will decrease. So this is from a known fact to a predicted result. That's how science works, right? Inductive reasoning is how science works. E effect to cause, a major earthquake has occurred. That's the effect. The cause, the cause was a shift in the fault line. So maybe you're looking at a specific area where 90% of the last um, earthquakes have been caused by a shift. So you're going to assume that this one was caused by a shift. Okay. So you want to use opinions that enhance credibility. You want to use sound and reliable statistics. And maybe even reluctant testimony shows that someone else has already been convinced with this same argument. And you want to use new and specific evidence, possibly even telling a story. So all those theories fit into our reasoning that we talked about. Then there's the opposite, deductive reasoning. Deductive down, the point is down. So it uses well-known and largely accepted rules or laws to persuade. And this is called syllogism. So it moves from a general rule to a specific instance. Here's an example. All humans are mortal. That is a well-known and largely accepted principle. Then we're going to go to a minor premise in the syllogism. Justin is a human. That's a specific observation. Conclusion, Justin is mortal. If used correctly, it will be accurate. If used correctly with accurate content, deductive reasoning guarantees we will be right. Yes? So used if used correctly with accurate content, deductive reasoning guarantees we will be right. Said that again. Okay. Example All tough drug laws introduced in medium sized communities result in diminished drug related crimes. That's a generally accepted statement. In this instance, San Marcos, Texas is a medium sized community. That's our specific instance. So, San Marcos should institute tough drug laws. That's an example of deductive reasoning. Okay. So here's an example. A boy puts his hand into a bag and pulls out three marbles, all of which are red. He then concludes that all the marbles are red. Which type of reasoning? That's inductive, right? We're going from these three instances. These three marbles are red, so we're going to conclude that all of them are red. Yes? 
Okay, using emotion to persuade. So going to that pathos, you might use metaphors and similes. You might use appropriate fear appeals with negative motivation. You might appeal to several different emotions, like in the Guide Made a Farmer video. You might appeal to audience members' beliefs and shared myths. A myth is not necessarily false, but a belief of how people may view their world. So how are people currently viewing your topic? Do you want them to shift to a new viewpoint? Okay. So the essential difference between emotion and reason is that emotion leads to action while reason leads to conclusions. People will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you make them feel. So we are relying both on that emotion, that pathos, and that logic, that logos, while always establishing that ethos, that credibility. Okay, guys, now we're going to move in to talking about organizational patterns. So watch the next video here, um, and we'll talk about organization for our persuasive assignments.